Thank you so much. Mentally honored to be here. Um, as Mary Jane said, my name is Dina Summers, and I'm with um, Ascension Technologies. I'm head of compliance with Ascension. We are a tribal-owned uh, managed service provider. We provide uh, risk, compliance, operational support, marketing for tribal companies in the lending space, and now in this new emerging uh, cannabis space. And infused banking, um, I've been working with banks for um, probably about five years now on uh, educating them on how to build a compliant cannabis program so that they can bank um, customers. Many banks, um, if they are not risk adverse to take on um, these considered higher risk customers, but there are higher risk money service businesses, payment processors, this is just one other um, customer type that banks just, uh, it's a learning curve they are familiar with, so I educate them on how they can compliantly bank these customers and hopefully open up the space for uh, more communities, uh, more people to um, enter the space. Um, so I will go ahead and um, we'll start with you. If you I know you gave a great introduction, but if you could probably add a few more words. Um, my name is Jill Wheaton Abraham. I am a member of the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho, and I own my own farm in Oregon. I'm one of the first licensed native wheat hemp growers in the U.S. and I farm uh, using natural farming methods. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jacob Omigo. I'm the president and CEO of Fairbank uh, Farm Nations Holding Company. Uh, our reservation is in Northeast Kansas. Uh, we have a kind of a diverse group of companies in agriculture, particularly hemp, is our newest venture. Uh, our operation guys are actually here. Somebody's talking this afternoon, but uh, we've been in the hemp industry for about two and a half years. You know, if you're not resilient and you're not uh, dedicated and you can see the, see a, a future in this planet, and I definitely encourage you to do something else. But uh, I, I grew up on the res, uh, attorney by trade, but uh, uh, kind of a knucklehead by everyday life. Um, hello, I'm Jen Deere and Water. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> sorry, my glasses were fogging. Um, I'm also the founder and executive director of Crushing Colonialism. We are an indigenous run and operated nonprofit working to elevate and support indigenous media makers. Um, I'm also a journalist. I'm a I'm freelance. I'm a contributor at Truth Out. I know I've interviewed a few of you in this room in the past. <laughs> um, and I was raised in rural parts of my nation's now reestablished reservation in northeastern Oklahoma and the, in West Texas near Abilene. So I grew up surrounded by oil and gas. So climate justice is a, a huge issue for me. It's really important. And I'm excited as a disabled person with chronic pain to also be up here to talk about cannabis, which is also really important to me. So, well done, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> So um, we are talking about climate change, um, particularly how um, tribes can lead the, lead the 17 UN sustainability initiatives um, and cannabis development. So uh, for the benefit of everyone in the room, I'm just going to read uh, a short preamble for and purpose of the 17 initiatives. Um, by 2030, the UN has resolved to end poverty and hunger everywhere to combat inequities, I'm sorry, inequalities with and among countries, to build peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, to protect human rights, and promote gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Also to ensure the lasting protection of the planet and its natural resources, to create conditions for sustainable, inclusive, and sustained economic growth, shared prosperity, and decent work for all taking into account different levels of national development and capacities. The Sustainable Development Goals are a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and improve the lives and prospects of everyone, everywhere. Um, goal number 13 is urgent action to combat 
climate change and its impact. And coincidentally, yesterday, the Climate Change Performance Index was published, and it's a um, survey that ranks countries uh, in their performance in addressing um, climate change. Denmark came in first, followed by Sweden and Chile. The um, EU came in 19. And of the 63 countries reviewed, the US trailed at 52nd place. Um, so circling this back to cannabis. So cannabis is a pretty eco-friendly uh, plant. It's versatile. It's one of the fastest growing commercial crops in the world. Um, it can actually even help um, clean soil that's been contaminated by other farming methods. Um, but despite all of that, cultivating cannabis can be an emissions heavy industry. So I'm gonna start um, with you, uh, Jill, if you could. Why is the cannabis industry struggling to match its sustainable image? Um, 
we can all join the colonizer project. We can all adopt the ways of the colonizer and become colonizers ourselves. So, um, While you're, while you're thinking, uh, or add more thoughts to that, Jacob, do you have a response for this? Well, you know, uh, we're talking about colonization and farming practices. Um, you know, we have a lot of you know, westernized farming techniques that we use. I'm from Kansas, so obviously there's a lot of row crop, row cropping and, and uh, you know, pesticides, all the chemicals, synthetic chemicals put on, on, the, on the land. But we're, you know, I always kind of pose this like, why does why do tribes have to lead this, this this fight or whatever? But you know, it makes sense in a way because, you know, we have a connection with our land. You know, we're not going to get any other land. The land is where it's at, um, and um, our just connection with it and how we have to care for it is something that we've uh, taken to our plans and how we farm in on our land. We're using regenerative practices. We're, you know, working with the soil. We're not adding a bunch of stuff to it. Uh, no-till, which is kind of this new technique in a lot of farming areas. And uh, you know, we have to educate farmers, because we're, we're going to process uh, in for industrial purposes. And uh, you know, we're trying to get, I'll say, non-native, mostly white farmers in Kansas to, uh, to uh, use a uh, endless rotational crop. And so you know, it's a lot of education there with the farmers and, and I, I say Kansas is doing a decent job uh, on the non-tribal side, but, but you know, my op operation guy, he's, he's educating me on, you know, we're using this type of soil, we're adding these things in there, which is organic, and this is why we're doing it, and I'm just like, why can't you just take that, you know, big piece of equipment out there and till the ground up and fill the seeds out? Well, it's not that easy. Uh, and I'm, you know, my, my, my dad's a uh, white guy, and he, his family was farmers, and so, but I have no, no connection with, with that type of farming. Um, and everything that, you know, at least in, in, in my tribe, you know, everything that we do is, is around the season. So springtime we're planting, there's certain ceremonies go along with it. Summertime is when we're growing. Certain things that we do then in the fall when we harvest. Um, so we are trying to bring some of those, these thoughts and, and the way how we conduct ourselves into what we are actually doing and not just kind of talk about it. Uh, we can do that if we, if we think about it enough, but we're actually trying to do it. So I don't know if that answers your colonialization question, but that's what I think. Um, I also just want to say something about the last question. Uh, so we can be a sustainable crop, but due to a variety of issues, predominantly the criminalization of it, it's often not sustainable. Um, being forced to grow and decide whether it's because of the criminalization or it's because of climate crisis issues actually uses a great amount of water and energy, like you mentioned. Um, and I'm a huge data and research nerd, so I brought a few stats with me. Um, so in Colorado, uh, the state's cannabis cultivators now account for 1.7% of the total CO2 emissions there. Uh, in Hawaii, it takes a carbon equivalent of a 16-gallon tank of gasoline to produce a single ounce of indoor weed. Um, and like I said, that's a lot of having to grow inside versus growing outside. Um, some other issues is because of the criminalization of it, there's not a great amount of research around it the way there is around other agricultural crops. Um, weed growers also don't get the same kind of tax breaks that other farmers and agricultural growers do. Um, and that can include trying to put in more climate-friendly lighting systems and ventilation and such. They just don't get those tax breaks. So I think all of those things, plus a great deal more that um, you all can speak to more as cannabis professionals, I think seems to lead to a part of the issues of uh, increasing the climate, climate crisis issues with me. Um, but in terms of colonialism and farming, I think one, kind of like I said, Federal, federal government making it harder to grow. But also, you know, my people, for example, the way that we would grow corn, which is one of our staple crops, you know, that connected to some of our earliest stories of the first human beings in our tribe. You know, that's, that's a very sacred thing when you think about the way that you grow the food and you interact with the land. But also, being from white farmers as well, that's not really the way I saw white people farming. 
It's more about how do I make money and how do I use this land in the most efficient manner. And while I understand a lot of small farms, I'm not talking big industry farms, but smaller farms are struggling. So many have closed over the years. But if you don't have that connection to the land, if you don't understand the way it works, if you refuse to honor it in the way that it works and grow <coughs> in an appropriate, sustainable manner, then you're just going to keep harming the land. And I really think that's just what colonization is about. Yeah. And at, the, at the end of the day, it's about coming in and taking whatever you want and using it up until you're done with it. I mean, look at all these billionaires out there trying to figure out how to go to space now. You know, they've kind of like, oh, we've destroyed the planet. Let's let's get out. Um, Anyway, before I ramble too much, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, you raised a good uh, point about profits, which I'll get to in a second. But Jake, um, you mentioned regen regenerative um, agriculture. Can you explain a little bit more what that is and how that can uh, impact um, cannabis cultivation? So, you know, it's, it's making sure that our souls are taken care of and that we're, you know, not waste. So, I remember back in the 1930s in the industrial era, era you know, and particularly cannabis, you know, we did all this tilling lost all the soil and all the nutrients really hard to get that back. I don't know all the science behind how many years it takes to get um, you know, your soil and you establish it from real crop um, farming, but um, this isn't something we just do one year and it's, it's fixed. Now, this is year after year after year we do these same practices and, and we move the soil, soil back from you know, conventional real cropping that relied heavily on you know, these um, synthetic nutrients to actually using natural nutrients to, to uh, have healthier soil and have healthier plants is what we think. And, and also this plant is really good at cleaning the soils and, and introducing some nutrients back. So um, you know we we plant on the same 90 acres to use around the end this year when we rotate it out the soil just so we can continue to do uh, uh, good practices and make sure that our soil is good for you know future generations to do stuff. One one thing that um, you know, we were a Great Lakes tribe and we were removed to Canvas and they wanted us to be farmers, but we, we, we were really horrible at you know, westernized farming and uh, we lost a lot of our land because of it. And, you know, the past 20 years we've been able to buy a significant amount of land back from, from people that were bought bad actors and farming and tearing up the land, whether they're overgrazing it or using all these, uh, these chemicals. So, um, you know, we're trying to bring those practices back. And um, I do think that there is a way to be uh, sustainable as far as revenue, because you can, you know, from a, I'm looking at a business perspective, you can get a little bit of margin if you have a, uh, you know, not all these other horrible metals and things like that in your, in your crop. So um, I think there is a way, and to be honest, we haven't found it yet because we're still new and we're still, uh, um, you know, finding out all of our customers and things like that. But, I think there is a way that, uh, to use these practices and make it a profitable um, business. So that's the chance we had. I do actually um, a couple things. I hate to bring up the, the colonization question, but I found my notes. <laughs> uh, because I think these are actually really important things to think about if uh, you want to actually grow. If you want to grow plants, but you want to grow for yourself, or you want to grow for your tribe, we actually do need to think about what it is we're doing if we're going to become agriculturalists and farmers, um, particularly living through the colonization project that is the U.S., the ongoing colonization project. Um, if we're going to talk about how colonization has impacted agriculture, I think we need to take a look at the world, you know, the land around us, how our trees have been cut, our uh, grasslands have been tilled up, they've been grazed over, and all of these things actually disrupt uh, the soil community. And so from the, not, you know, colonization isn't just a concept or something that happened to humans, it's something that happened to the earth as well, and is ongoing. And that does impact how we grow, where we grow, and what we can grow. Um, you know, you brought up uh, heavy metals and contamination Tribal lands oftentimes are marginalized lands, and so whether you might have a, a lack of easy access to water or you're trying to clean up industrial waste, um, these are things that are put upon us that now we have to deal with as colonized people. 
Um, another way that colonization has impacted agriculture is it cr created the myth that we were wandering groups of hunter-gatherers that didn't know how to plant foods, let alone grow our own foods, let alone build city-states that were actually sustained by large-scale sustainable agriculture. Um, so you know, that's something that we need to remember. A lot of us have lost our ability to learn. My tribe actually cultivated tobacco um, right near the Canadian, what is now the Canadian border, a place that we don't really think of as capable of cultivating tobacco. You know, my tribe is often thought of as fisher, fishermen, hunters, but we were also horticulturalists. And you know, that's something that we have lost that we need to all kind of reach back and remember, like who amongst us were farmers that we don't even really know about today. Um, another thing that you know, colonization has done to agriculture is it took away a lot of the roles of women. Uh, a lot of times now, you know, farming is very much a male-dominated profession. Uh, whether you're black, white, indigenous, whatever, you know, it's not really a space where women are present and are considered um, knowledgeable, let alone experts. And traditionally, that was not how we structured our communities. Everybody had a place, and everybody had a story and something to contribute, and that's something that you know we've lost, and that we can bring back as you know we begin to start your cannabis journeys. Um, colonization also displaced and disappeared the the people who originally lived in those places, moved them around. You know, when the colonizers came here, there's always talk about, oh my gosh, the amount of salmon, the huge trees, these abundant, fertile soils. That didn't just happen. Those were indigenous people that were fostering that relationship that goes on from the, the ground to the air. And, you know, that's something that, that never is really talked about. I, I come from the Pacific Northwest. You know, salmon is a huge commodity. It's, it's celebrated as a symbol, but but people don't ever really think about. You know, the reason those salmon streams were so abundant was because the indigenous people were part of the community. It wasn't separate from us. Um, you know, we've also lost a lot of keystone species in a lot of places, like grizzly bears, wolves. Um, you know, we've had. Moose gets placed by deer. These are all things that impact agriculture that are a result of colonization. And things that um, the way we all farm could actually reverse. Um, and finally, you know, colonization really stopped a lot of our relationships with the land by being moved, by you know, eliminating whole communities. And these are all things that we all need to um, kind of Again, bring back you know these 17 sustainability goals. When I started reading them, I thought, you know what this is? This is the world trying to reverse what for us has been almost 500 years of colonization. You know, these are actually goals to reverse what capitalism, what globalization, what all of these things have done to the whole planet. And now the UN and everybody that's you know joining along, we're trying to stop what has taken, you know, hundreds of years to do. And so, so for me, I don't see this as like, oh, people are looking at us to lead the way, you know, you know, we have to do this because nobody else has. You know, we all have a responsibility. You know, like I said, we, you know, we can all become colonizers. We're all part of a global culture now that, that you can find anywhere in the world, and each and every single one of us whether we're business owners or just individuals, it's time for us to start integrating these 17 things into our lives. Um, but going back to farming, <laughs> um, you know, we talk about uh, regenerative agriculture, we talk about uh, sustainable farming, but what exactly is that? Um, there are actually five uh, kind of principles of regenerative agriculture. And um, they are basically like soil mulching, keeping your soil covered and protected. Um, not only does that bring in like soil temperature, uh, water, 
retention and um, provides habitat for um, everything from bacteria to small animals. Um, it's, it's really important because uh, it stops the evaporation of your soil. As you, know, you, you spoke about water use, um, you know, that is, that's my biggest expense as an outdoor grower. Indoors, um, of course, it's electricity, but um, outdoors, you, know, you have to think about how you're protecting your soil, and that's the first, first step of actually regen regenerative agriculture is uh, keeping, keeping your water. Um, the second principle is diversity. Uh, the more plants you have in an area, the more animals you're going to get, the more birds you're going to get, the more you're going to mimic what has already been lost. My farm uh, was, is actually in the industrial section of town. I, I farm right in town, right near the elementary and high school, because I believe that if you're going to you know, be part of the situation, you gotta be proud. It's no longer time to hide away. It's no longer time to be like, oh, I don't know. You know, we have a system within our body that needs cannabinoids, and it's time that we accept that and be proud of what we do. So, you know, diversity. You need to bring diversity to your soil, um, because what ultimately that will do is encourages bacteria and fungus to grow, which makes your plants grow. Um, the third principle of regenerative agriculture is um, keeping a live, living root mat all the time. So you have to cover crop. Um, it varies by region. Uh, what I use is um, white clover and crimson clover because they're nitrogen fixers. Uh, but then I also mulch. So you know I have patches on my like the rows in between my plants where. I've got some tree oil, which is considered an invasive weed, but it's also a nitrogen fixer, and it keeps the deer from eating my plants. So I leave it, because it's doing the same job that my clover would be doing. But because the earth is putting it in there, I'm leaving it there, when really it's considered a weed. Um, what these cover crops do is they actually move nutrients from the soil into the plant, and when you mulch your plants back onto the soil, you're returning the nutrients back to the soil. So you're beginning the circle that's disrupted by conventional agriculture, or in my case, the, the scraping away of my land. And then um, animal integration. So a lot of times we think of, um, you know, gotta have some cows, gotta have some chickens, gotta have some pigs. Um, but what we do is uh, we don't fence, so we let the deer come and till the soil for us with their hooves. We let them um, leave their waste, which in turn supplements the nutrients that we have. And then finally, um, we need to minimize, minimize soil disturbance. So again, um, as Jay said, no tilling is basically it. So I'm going to go to the lawn. <laughs> you may have thought you needed your notes, but you no, know. thank you so much for that. Um, I have a question for you, Jen, um, because I know this is something that you wanted to discuss today, uh, make sure we have time for this question. How does cannabis, um, and, and part two is how does cannabis and climate crisis impact uh, disability? Um, well, it's a number of ways. Um, so I wanted to start just to let you all know how high the rates of disabilities are for Native people. So it's uh, what's recorded data is that 24% of us who are considered American Indian and Alaska Native are disabled. Um, per capita, we have the highest rates of disabilities of any other ethnic or racial group in this country. And while there is very limited research on an international level, anything that I've been able to find is that indigenous people, whether it's New Zealand, Australia, Nepal, we have some of the highest rates of disabilities. So when you take into account these high rates of disabilities, plus the way the climate crisis is so directly impacting us, you've got a double whammy. You know, I have to think about where I live. What's air pollution like? How am I gonna escape if there's a climate catastrophe, you know, what's what's going to happen in the future to healthcare? I mean, I'll say our healthcare system was not that great pre-COVID and now it's awful. 
I mean, I don't, I can't speak to other places, but here in DC, we have had a mass exodus of providers from the hospitals that take public health insurance. Many people are going into private practice now, or they're just flat out quitting. You know, so trying to get healthcare in general is so hard. And then cannabis, for some people, it is healthcare. You know, it is medicinal. Um, you know, I believe in the complete. Um, Oh my gosh, <laughs> my brain just froze. <laughs> I'm not a morning person, I apologize. Um, you know, I believe that it should be complete, there, legalization. I believe in complete legalization of it, but for those of us who use it medicinally, who need it medicinally, there are a lot of extra barriers. You know, if you uh, live in any kind of housing, if you're a disabled person, like a nursing home, a care facility of some kind, um, you know, you have Section 8 housing, things that many disabled people need because we live so disproportionately in poverty, you can't use weed under those circumstances. You get kicked out. You could lose your housing voucher. You could become houseless. Um, you know, so I just, when I think about climate and disability justice, they both go together, and cannabis is such a part of that. You know, we right now, I just looked at the stats, uh, as of November 8th, a little over 50% of this country is in a drought, and a little over 60% of the continental US is in a drought. You know, so I think about what happens if cannabis becomes rarer. What does that mean for people who are already suffering from health issues that are not getting care, from disabilities that we're not getting care. Um, there's just, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways that these all tie together. Um, and, you know, I mean, I know we've had a lot of movement from veterans who have really advocated for legalization and, you know, medical marijuana. So there has been some movement, but I genuinely feel like until we have it legalized on that federal level, it's still going to be a type of medicine that disabled people are not going to have the same access to as other able-bodied people. Um, yeah, and that, that climate and that indigeneity piece go together. You know, I also, it's not to go off on a tangent, but tribal sovereignty, man. Like, <laughs> tribes have a right to do what we want to do on our lands. And for me, that should be, you know, legalization and growing of cannabis where it's an appropriate crop for a tribe. Um, I'd also really like to see in Indian country us start talking about disability and disability justice. It's not often talked about, um, you know, I'll say, and I know this is a byproduct of colonization, but we have a lot of ableism in our community. Um, you know, I found that there have been some different Native events I've wanted to go to. There was a big two-spirit gathering, but they had a hard, no cannabis, we don't care if you need it rule. And for me, I was like, well, you know, there's a time and a place where you do and don't use it, and you should be respectful of other people, but for folks that that's medicine, that's just one more area in which we're excluded from. Yeah, so that's just a few ways that these issues all tie together, and we really, as communities and tribes, we really need to be talking about this stuff and working on it. When we were um, on our call last week for, um, discussing preparing for today's panel, you know, Jacob, you came back to, which the reality is, at the end of the day, we still have to make a profit. Um, and you touched on it um, a little bit earlier during this um, discussion. Um, is it possible, and if, even then, what are the challenges? Is it possible for cannabis growers to be both profitable and stewards and custodians of the environment? Yeah, I definitely think it is. And um, like we're not in, you know, we're, we're in the end, but we do dry land farming, so you know, cannabis is in a significant drought. Um, but it, you know, there's people that are already doing this. I mean, we're not the we're not the first to to, to grow this plant and grow it in a sustainable way. So. We, you know, creating new partnerships with uh, people already in the industry, whether it's uh, you know large growers or large uh, you know foreign companies, we we did our diligence and we went over to Holland, we went to you know Colorado, we went all over to go to study this before we said this is what we want to do. And I would say this like there's a lot of great advocates in this in area, and then the consultants will will, will sell you this uh, bright shiny new thing, but you have to do the the work yourself and you have to figure it out because. They'll give you this million things that this plant can do, but you say, well, which one? You know, 
be sustainable in, in bring revenue back to the community or bring jobs or whatever it is, whatever your goal is. And uh, you don't really get that answer. You have to go and determine it yourself and, and, and make your path. And it is not easy to push by in any stretch, but uh, I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> How long did that process take? So we've been looking at this even before the 2018 farm uh, bill was passed. Our, our tribal council was really, you know, interested in, in then it was CBD, right? Uh, and then in the future, then the cannabis, which is still uh, illegal in the state of Kansas, and we have a unique law where the state actually has criminal jurisdiction, so we and we can't do anything yet that differs. But um, you know, we've been looking at this for at least four years, and it's interesting. The company we actually that came to the to the tribal council at that time, uh, hey, you know, we'll, we'll white label this for you. We have this product. We're going to use your your Indianness uh, to sell this. Uh, you know, they're a really shady company out of Colorado, and then you know they really sue each other leadership so you just have to be really careful um, who you who you do business with but creating part so part of its UN uh, initiative is, is creating partnerships so even uh, tribes partnering together is going to be important uh, tribes partnering with other indigenous uh, owners uh, women owners you, you know is, is important because we have to um, this is an emerging area era uh, area and uh, there's no one one business one tribe that can do this alone so Creating partnerships is, you know, and it's it's kind of tough for us because we're not, you know, we're got you know, a lot of great partners in the gaming area, tobacco and those other area, areas, but uh, you know, getting out here and coming to events like these and meeting folks and you know, bringing actual people that are on the ground in our company that are, are growing it and feeling the time every day is important to me. So I'm, me as the CEO sits in office, says, yeah, let's go spend money over there. I can't be the only one that's out here talking to have to bring the guy that's. Uh, and the, the women that are actually doing this, so that's important to me and how, and how we conduct ourselves, how I hope that will turn us into a, a you know, this, this is sustainable uh, era, um, business venture for us. And uh, I really do think that, you know, this is like a five year plan for us, we're in year two. So, you know, as we're, we're investing in it, you know, I, I think it'll be a minimum five years until we get it's probably break even, which is, you know, when I went to get the funding from our, our tribe, that's why I told them, this isn't, uh, this is not just going to flip a machine and, you know, somebody's just going to put this money in it. This is, this is a really, really a challenging area, and uh, the legal framework is really challenging. So, um, bear with us. Don't lose sight of our goal. Uh, but, yeah, I think it, uh, it definitely is a possibility, yes. I love it, and I love being involved so early in the industry still in its nascent stages and um, you know getting back to being able to shape it but I wanted because um, that would be my final question but I wanted to see if you wanted to weigh in on oh I just wanted to say a grower friend of mine said it best this isn't a business it's a lifestyle We might be a little ahead of schedule, um, but I'm going to close with the last question for each of you, and it's uh, really two part. And this question is also um, kind of an extension of our conversation last week, where we had differing opinions, which I appreciate. Um, Native American producers have long been left out of the agricultural conversation, but more and more, the climate movement is recognizing that indigenous knowledge on climate change mitigation and adaptation can benefit the world. So first, um, what role should or do you think indigenous peoples um, should play in the universal call to combat uh, climate change? Um, and then after that, how can um, Native American tribes positively impact and shape the cannabis industry? So first, what role should um, indigenous people play in this world call and then what could the positive impact be? I'm going to talk to three. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> she's very, she has very great opinions, and she's very well versed in speaking about it. Yeah, but I think we have to think of leadership role. First of all, like, you know, I, I kind of had troubles with this ideal of the mystical, the mythical Indian, and we're all at one with the environment, because not every tribal nation has done that. So, some have been bad actors, in fact, whether that was industry or whatever. So we're not perfect. We're not this mythical creature, but we do need to take the lead on this. We, we can, first of all, we can, because we have the know-how, and we have a lot of knowledge in our community, so 
I do think we, we, we can and we should, and at Prairie Man, we definitely are with how we're, we're doing our practices there, so. Um, but I know you have a lot of opinion on it, and I would love to. <laughs> I think Carol and Helen should go first. Oh. <laughs> Um, I think Jacob just made a good point about tribes. I mean, we've got a tribal counselor on my, my tribe's council that is very pro-resource extraction and has some bad politics all around, in my opinion. So while I believe very strongly in tribal sovereignty, not everyone in our tribes is pro pro environment <laughs> in the ways that they should be. And I understand, you know, the, the forced poverty that we've been put into and the, the colonizer created resource scarcity has put many of our, our tribes in this position of how do we make money to keep our people alive. Um, so I want to try to say I understand it's a complex issue, but also, you know, 80% of the world's biodiversity is uh, to the south of us and what the indigenous people there call the yellow. Um, so in the Amazon rainforest area, uh, you know, in the tribes there, they don't really have any sort of recognition by their governments. Uh, many of them are being killed and being pushed off the lands for logging, large-scale agricultural, oil, gas, mining. Um, you know, all of our green technologies, they're not really that green. They still require mining. Um, so having indigenous people be the people who are making decisions about the land is so crucial to the well-being of the land and to our environments. Um, you know, and I, there's actually a really cool movement happening right now. It's not indigenous-led, so I wanna point that out, but it's called Debt for Climate. And it's really, they have a really good, interesting, and anti-colonial framework about how the World Bank and the G7 nations, basically the US, the UK, you know, um, and so on, have created this debt for the global south, um, and how that ends up producing more resource extraction, you know, because you've got these horrible high interest loans that you cannot pay off, so then you get pushed into these these backdoor shady deals for pipelines or mining projects and things, and that goes through indigenous lands generally. So I think having indigenous people at the table is so crucial to this, and really I shouldn't even say at the table, we should be the ones in charge, because that table was built with our stolen trees, yep. on our stolen land, and that's that. <laughs> Good segue into Jill's. Um, well, I just, I think we all have a role to play as, in, you know, as individuals. Um, we need to be looking at ourselves and how we use resources. Um, that's, you know, first and foremost. Um, by doing that and being critical of ourselves and you know making improvements, that is how we become leaders in our larger community. Whether it's the indigenous community, you know, if you're from an urban community, your neighbors, if you're from a rural community, you know, your neighbors far away. That's you know that's the role we have to play. Um, people all you know, there is the myth of the noble savage, you know, and. It's, it's not reality, but um, it's something that we can um, aspire to at least show the way to people who think that it's impossible. I think one of the greatest things we actually have the ability to do um, is, is it's like this. People say, oh, I couldn't imagine giving up cars. I can imagine, you know, not flying. You know, we can't imagine making huge changes in our lives. It seems impossible. But as indigenous people who have gone through colonization and all of the pains, we have shown that in a very short amount of time, you can completely change everything you do and still survive. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I know everyone agrees, I uh, appreciate your insightful comments and helpful comments, especially with the um, sustainable farming. Um, Actually, we're out of time, so we can open up for questions if there are any. Yes, please. 